Afri is a company that might not sound familiar to you, but it's actually uh, um, a merge between Poiri and IF Consult and formers, uh, if you have worked with them here in Switzerland and maybe abroad, you know, like companies such as Electrobat, Motor Columbus, Editoscano or Colenco. We are a multinational company and in Switzerland we have 1,000 employees and 20 branch offices uh, around, uh, around the country. We are mostly working in infrastructure, energy and management consulting. Abroad, we are present in more than 20 countries and we are operating worldwide. And uh, the department I work with is dedicated to hydroelectricity and dam, and we cover a large range of services from pre-feasibility studies, impact assessment, project design, rehabilitation, construction projects, and expert surveillance mandates. So let's start uh, uh, by the global picture. Here you, you can see uh, um, how dams are currently being distributed. So this is, uh, uh, if you are uh, uh, familiar with the monthly water maps, this is a graphic that, that it's from the Geneva Water Hub. We have currently 58,000 large dams worldwide. Most of which they are concentrated in Asia. Half of them, they are in China. Europe and North America. The construction of large dams became very widespread in the 20th century, with the most iconic dams uh, that which have been constructed between 1930 and 1970. Uh, we all know that they provide uh, tremendous benefits to the communities, including hydropower, water for consumption, and as well irrigation. Uh, it's important to know that from all these dams, uh, only 20% uh, or 19% in this case provide hydropower. This is uh, something that people are very surprised to know because most of the dams that we have worldwide, the large dams at least, they are dedicated to uh, water irrigation for agriculture. Uh, if we look now at the second graphic here in the right side, we will see that not all the countries where most big dams are, are the largest uh, um, users of electricity. So this is from past year, and then we observe that there's a large difference between regions and countries. For example, in Africa, we will see the Republic of Congo, Zambia, Ethiopia, Guinea, Central Africa, and Mozambique obtain more than 80% of the electricity production from hydropower dams. In Asia, this is concentrated as well in high mountain areas, Nepal, North Korea, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan, while Paraguay outstands in South, uh, South America. If we look at the north, uh, what we see is Norway, Greenland, and these are the, the two biggest uh, users of hydroelectricity. And as well in the Balkans, uh, Georgia, for example, is like a, a high uh, user of, of hydroelectricity. Here in Switzerland, uh, even if we have 223 large dams, we are only about 60% of the total uh, electricity production. So let's move now to the global trends. Um, and uh, we have mentioned climate change. We have uh, mentioned as well that, that the population is increasing. Uh, water demands are increasing, and there's a push to reduce as well the dependence on fossil fuels and uh, to, um, uh, to meet the Paris, uh, Paris Agreement uh, commitments by 2030. So hydropower contributes to the sustainable goal uh, number seven, which is universal access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy by 2030. And reservoirs uh, also contribute to other SDGs like water, resilient infrastructure, and climate change. Uh, the International Energy and Agency Net Scenario estimates that we have to double by 2030 our production in electricity if we want to decarbonize the electricity sector. That's at least uh, uh, 1,300 gigabytes of new hydropower capacity in the world. So besides that, besides adding new hydropower uh, capacity, there are a lot of facilities, existing facilities that needs more rehabilitation and as well that needs upgrading in the machinery. 
Uh, and just to mention, because I select most of the dams were built between 1930 and 1970, it's more or less estimated that 20% 20, 20 of all the dams existing right now will uh, be more than 55 years old uh, soon which is more or less the edge where every uh, kind of electromechanical equipment needs to be rehabilitated. So that makes a lot of interventions that we have to plan in these coming years. So because all of that, and may, uh, we have been observing since 1970 a large dam construction renaissance a bit everywhere, uh, especially in develop developing countries. And currently, and this is the graphic and the red points that you see, uh, we have more than 3,700 uh, large dams currently planned or under construction. These are mostly uh, concentrated in, in uh, Southeast Asia, South America, the Balkans, and a bit as well in Africa. Um, and if we look at the countries, then we have most of the projects are in Brazil, Nepal, and Turkey, and India by... Uh, importance. Another interesting thing to note in the global trends, and you see the second graphic here, is more and more we see uh, in hydropower development a new type of, of not new, but uh, uh, winning a bit uh, popularity is the pump, pumped storage plants. I think everyone has heard about it. How it works is like two different reservoirs that will uh, act like a battery and move up and down uh, water, creating energy depending on the water needs. Since 2021, China has a plan to roll out this kind of uh, dam nationwide, and we also see this trend in the United States and Europe. While conventional uh, dams is what we are most building right now, pumping storage plants, they represent up to 20% of the total type of dams. But, of course, this has impacts, and this has a lot of impacts, and this is a graphic that I'm very proud to show, and people are a bit surprised because I'm coming from the dam world that I show this, but actually, uh, in 2019, this appeared in Nature, and we see here, or they warned us that just one-third of the, of the rivers, the world's biggest, largest rivers, remain free-flowing. Free and this is the Amazon, La Plata, the Ganja Paramaputa, and Congo River basins. And if you remember the previous slides, that's exactly where most large dams are being built. The result of this is not a global conspiracy of dam builders to destroy nature, but simply the fact that dams are often planned and built at the individual level. Uh, we are looking at the project and the impacts at the project level, making it difficult to assess the real impacts across the entire river basin. So for example, a, a good case of that is like the Mekong River, where some of you have been working, that we see that kind of, of cascade of, uh, of negative impacts. So. Fortunately, the use of global databases, studies like this one, real-time data from satellites and sensors, allow us to be more aware on human interventions and its associated impacts. So. And in response to these free-flowing flow, rivers and this new uh, renewed dam construction boom, we also observe uh, the anti-dam movement, which is making a comeback lately. And we have more and more projects uh, about removing weirs and dams. So this, why is that? It's a mix of uh, social eco ecological reasons and as well economic reason, uh, reasons, because some of them, they are quite old and it's more, uh, I mean, it's better to remove them than, than keep them operating or even rehabilitating these. Uh, these dam removals will allow uh, reducing the barriers uh, for sediments and fishes to move up and down uh, the rivers. And this was mostly initiated in the United States. Here is the graphic that we see. Uh, the black line is the total of dam removals. We see like how this has been increased uh, over the years. And as well, we see the other colors representing the size of the dams being removed. So mostly they are small to medium dams, but of course we as well have uh, examples uh, such as the Klamat River in the States or the Celion River in France, uh, which have like a considerable size and which are classed as large dams. 
In Europe, we have seen this uh, type of approach more and more, and in 2020 only we removed 101, and currently we count with a total of uh, 6,700 dams successfully removed. And countries uh, that have been doing this, it's Austria, Belgium, Cyprus, Denmark, England, Spain, Montenegro, uh, even Switzerland, Ukraine, Wales, uh, Portugal, and Scotland. So this is something that we are seeing more and more to recover the natural uh, ecosystem uh, in rivers. So now moving to dams at altitude, of course, uh, um, the advantages we have is that there's like a, a huge, uh, well, first of all, there's water availability. We have a lot of water up in the mountain region, regions and as well for hydropower is perfect because what we need is like a height difference. So uh, that's why uh, the largest dams are located in high, high mountain areas. The primary aim of this kind of dam was to provide peak period electrical energy, but it has gradually been diversificating uh, in, the, in the uses, for example, tourist development, mountain lakes, fishing, water sports, uh, industrial heritage tourism, and I think we, we all know now, because we have been walking here in the Alps, that dams are like a, a place to go. Uh, to my knowledge, there's no statistic information on how many dams are actually built in high altitude areas, but some of the largest ones uh, are, uh, or the highest ones are Jinping one in China, and Khmer and Terry dams in India, and even La Grande Dam in, in Canada. And uh, currently in China, for example, we see that more and more dams are being built in high altitude, in particular in Sichuan and Yunnan provinces. Here we have a couple of examples of Switzerland that you might know. Uh, besides Grand Exams and on Grand Schemes, which is as well a pumped storage plant that works together with uh, Lake Lehman, which is just in front of us, we also have two large projects worth mentioning. First one is Nande Drans, where AFRI was involved, um, and it's providing 900 megawatts of pumped storage scheme. And second one is Mutze Dam, uh, which was uh, designed and constructed by Gruner in Glarus, that has a production of one gigabyte. The second one, the Mutze, uh, it's the uh, highest placed dam in Europe. And as well, it has like a, a particularity, like I don't know if you can see it uh, from the picture, but uh, all the dam walls are covered by solar panels, which additionally provides 2.2 megawatts. So. Then in the second line, you see uh, also examples from high altitude dams where AFRI is intervening. For example, the well-known uh, Ragun Dam and its power plant in Tajikistan, Jayaburi in Lao. Um, Ragun actually needs no introduction. It has been a long-standing project. Uh, and, uh, and this uh, super large dam, it will be like the highest uh, uh, in the world when it's built and will double the production of electricity in the country. Uh, Zayaburi, it's as well a uh, hydroelectric runoff uh, power, power plant, which is in the Mekong River. And uh, the particularity is that they have uh, been working a lot with, uh, with the fish migration system and uh, with high ecological standards. Another project under construction is the Dayamar Basha in Pakistan. It's an RCC gravity dam, uh, which is in the Indus River. That's the last one. So a bit of benefits and impacts. So we know that they are Dams, large dams in particular, they are very costly and they take a long time to, to be built. But once they are there and under proper maintenance, and, and uh, can last for centuries. It is an opportunity for energy production, but as well it can uh, create a lot of environmental and social impacts. And as mentioned, a lot of countries between sectors and political unrest if the waters are shed between, between countries. Among the benefits, um, of course, because you are at high altitude, we will generate a lot of hydroelectric power. Because we are in steep valleys and narrow conditions, they provide the perfect uh, uh, 
setting for storing large volumes of waters. They also have the advantage that, uh, that uh, uh, they allow like a better water storage because we have less evaporative transpiration losses and in general as well, general silt less silting, so less sediments coming into the reservoir. Also good competent rock foundations allow for light, large heights and they can uh, uh, very, very, be very convenient in case we have to raise uh, to increase capacity. Foundations on design, they are easier to make in high altitude because we have this uh, good rock foundation. In general, uh, they can, uh, we can build uh, art stamps which are um, built with less uh, uh, concrete than other type of dams. We uh, improve flood protection with it and we have less social impact as well because normally in high altitudes you don't have uh, huge uh, settlements of, of uh, people. And then, of course, we have rec recreational and touristic activities that count as benefits. Impacts, I'm not going to go uh, a lot on it because I think that those, the following speakers will concentrate a lot on it, uh, but they do impact biodiversity. And as mentioned before, the ecosystems are very pristine uh, at its, these stages. And they are as well um, very sensitive to alterations. Other things that were mentioned in the introduction is the geological instabilities. With glacier retreat, we see more and more debris flows, rock falls, uh, reactivations of landslides, uh, glacier collapses that can create waves that go into the reservoir and can impact the infrastructure and as well like the population downstream. And regarding uh, construction and, and maintenance, we have harsh weather conditions, so it's very complicated to, uh, to build dams at the high altitude and also to, to do uh, operation and maintenance uh, works. So, of course, limited access accessibility during winter time or in case of, of uh, rain. So. And then while we are impounding, we can as well have induced seismicity. This is not only for high, uh, high altitude reservoirs, but a, a bit everywhere when you impound a large reservoir, this can create or reactivate existing faults. So. Um, here we see a bit the potential for development, what we are doing. There, are, there is certainly construction of new dams, but as well there's a lot of dams that need rehabilitation or as well repurposing, so we can use uh, the same infrastructure for other uses. We can as well work into, uh, or do projects about modernization of existing power plants. We can as well, and this is uh, an, another or a part which is like less uh, discussed, at least in uh, engineering uh, talks, is like the collaboration between different regions. So there exist ways as well to uh, negotiate like the utilizations of dams or even joint dam construction. And then of course, uh, lastly, it's like to use uh, technologies and investments for uh, good practices. So. Uh, I will just go quickly with this. There are a lot of uh, actions and impacts that we can do to reduce um, the impacts of dams in biodiversity. For example, fish ladder and passages, I think we will see some examples afterwards that, uh, that allowed or uh, this fish uh, migration and uh, lower as well um, fish mortality. We can as well enforce environmental and residual for, uh, flows, which is a project that Geneva Water Hub has been leading with IUCN. This will maintain the natural balance in the river ecosystem. They will as well reduce uh, erosion. Also sediment management using flashings. Um, controlling upstream, this is something that people uh, tend to, to forget a bit. Like we have as well to take care of the upstream of the dam, uh, in particular all um, the maintenance of, of uh, the forest uh, to, uh, to impact in a good way the, the uh, volumes of sediments which is end up in the reservoir. And of course, promote community engagement and then do uh, environmental and social impact assessments for every project. And as I told, not only for the project itself, but it would be a good practice as well to do it for the whole uh, um, catchment. So finding a balance between uh, benefits and impacts of dams has always been complicated. I think since U U 
IUCN and World Bank study uh, in 1997 and then the World Commission of, of Dams in 2000. Much has changed in the practice. Uh, here we see, we see some examples, which is like the environmental and social uh, framework from the World Bank or other ESG, which is environmental, social and governance standards and requirements uh, that are uh, asked uh, by financiers and most recently as well the establishment of new certifications and bond instruments that ensure that the impacts of infra infrastructure, they are not so uh, important. In the United States, I would like to mention a couple of uh, events. Uh, first of one is the memory of understanding uh, between the federal hydropower to increase hydropower generation and flexibility. And the second one is the landmark agreement between the US hydropower and conservation groups, um, which recognizes the need to, to tackle ch climate change with renewable energies, so they allow the construction of, of new dams, but also whilst preserving uh, healthy rivers. And here in Switzerland in 2021, this exercise was as well uh, done in uh, 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 in different conversations between the government and all the stakeholders, and the result of which uh, was a list of 15 potential new hydropower projects, which will lead to an additional capacity of two terawatt hours of winter production. For example, this will impact Chumernze, Kurnera Alps, Gorner, Gugra, Grise, Matmarkse. So some of them, they are already existing and they will be heightened. And as well, they have been selected with high standards of um, biodiversity and social impact. So I would like to end this presentation remembering that dams, uh, if are well placed and well designed, can be an integral part of energy transition. That nowadays impacts are very well known and at the end of the day we all have the responsibility to work with high standards and as well to collaborate across sectors, industries, and discipline to build or remove, as we can see, dams, uh, because this is the right way to address energy and climate change challenges while preserving the health of our rivers. So thanks a lot for this. And